We're thankful for that, and we're thankful that we can be together as we do that. We're thankful for the time change, bringing us more daylight hours, and we're thankful for all the good blessings God pours down into our lives. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 12, that's where we'll begin reading in just a moment. Acts chapter 12, beginning verse 6. There was a man whose house was covered, the water was rising around his house in a flood, and he moved to his roof of his house. Stranded, looking for help of some sort, and a man in a boat drove by. He called to the man on the roof, hey, I've got a spot for you, hop in the boat. And the man said, no, no, thank you for the offer, but I've been praying to God. I'm asking, I know God will come through with a miracle. And so the boat goes on and saves someone else. Soon the waters kept rising and the waters now are up to his waist. Another second boat drives by with a man in the boat and says, Hey, we've got a spot. Hurry now. We can save you. man says, No, no, I'm praying for a miracle. God will respond. I know he will. So you go on and save someone else. Now the waters are up to his waist. Third boat drives by. Different man, different boat. Hey, buddy, hop in. Just in time. We'll save you. No, no, I'm praying to God. I know God will hear my prayer. He will rescue me and bring a miracle to save me. Finally, the water's up to his chin, and his chin's beginning to bob beneath the surface, and a helicopter flies by. They drop the rope, and they scream out, Sir, grab the rope! He's garbled in his response, and he says, No, 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 thank you, but I'm praying to God for a miracle to rescue me. Next thing he notices, he's at the pearly gates. And we know this is not true, right, theologically, okay? But he's at the pearly gates, and the gatekeeper says, Hello, sir. How'd you end up here? What's what's the deal? He said, Well, actually, my house was flooding. I was about to drown, and I kept praying and kept praying and kept praying for a miracle. Uh, But God never responded with my request. The gatekeeper said, Well, son, I really don't think you should be complaining because we sent three angels in a boat and one in a helicopter and you ignored all four. Joke that may be. Is that not often how we think about, we culturally have come to think about angels? How does God order the spiritual universe in conjunction with the physical world we live in when it comes to these beings called angels. Acts chapter 12 is a passage we read in our daily Bible reading this past week. And it features a situation largely similar to that joke. Acts chapter 12, beginning verse 6. It's Peter's angel story. We might hear people that have an angel story. Maybe some people have their own. Acts chapter 12. What's Peter's angel story? Now, Herod heard that. um, Now, when Herod was about to bring Peter out on that very night, meaning bring him out to execute him, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. The the sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, woke him, saying, Get up quickly. The chains fell off his hands. The angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out, he followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gates leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. They went out, went along one street. Immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Fascinating story, powerful story, because the Lord had not spared James before Peter. James was executed for his faith. We know from the pages of history that Peter would not be spared at a later date when he was in prison. But here is a time when Peter was rescued, the text says, directly by an angel, and he is aware, based on the evidence based on the miraculous happening. Oh, that was clearly a messenger, an angel, sent from God. When you read through the pages of the Bible, it's clear and obvious that angels are an inescapable reality. 
They're mentioned, actually, the word is mentioned more times in the New Testament than the Old. Have you ever realized that? When you count the number of times angel is used, it's used 175 times in the New Testament and about 108 in the Old Testament. There may be other times that other words are used, but the word angel is actually used more than new than the old. So they're inescapable. And we have much of a fascination about them. No matter the religion around the world, there is some use or some role of angels in that religion. It's rare, almost impossible to find some sort of official religion that does not have angels as a part of their structure, their hierarchy, their beliefs. God has spoken much about them. We are fascinated by them. Sometimes what we believe or what we talk about when we talk about angels brings comfort. All those things considered, we have to be sure that we are, and this is just a sampling of some of the ways we think about them. Probably should have had that up there for some of our discussion. But what we envision in our minds is one thing. But we need to be sure, as with anything, to ask the question, is what we believe about angels... The same thing that God says about angels. And so we can't answer that question all on its own, or at least answer all of what God says about that. We can't do that all in one setting. But I think we can give a big enough view to be able to, to push ourselves in the right direction so that we know some things that are for sure about them, so that we are not misled, so that we don't misspeak, so that we don't teach our, our children perhaps the wrong thing about angels. Anything that in, is involved in God's redemptive work to save man is worth studying, is worth considering, as long as we allow God to be the one to lead us through his word in that study. And so, what we should notice is that the true study of angels should give us much, much comfort. And so when we find the truth, and we'll find the comfort God promises through these things. What we're going to do is use three passages from Hebrews uh, that describe angels and some aspects of them and, and do some branching off from each of those throughout the course of the night. So first of all, look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. You remember the context from this morning's lesson, the difference between Christ as the messenger, the superior son, and the angels who communicated, transmitted the law. In describing the contrast between the son and angels, the author asks a rhetorical question but one with a clear, affirmative answer. Chapter 1, verse 14 of Hebrews, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So did you hear it? They are ministering spirits. Angels are not human. Neither to the other extreme are angels deity. Angels are not God. They are ministering spirits. God is by nature spirit. He created angels. They are by nature spirit, but they are not God. They are sent out, number four, sent out by God for the sake of those who would be faithful to him. So consider Psalm number 148, verse 2. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Angels worship God. Why? Verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. See, God created angels. Angels worship God. They're not human. Neither are they deity. They were created beings, or are created beings. They worship God as such. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. You are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, heaven of heavens, with all their host. That's another word that's used to describe angels. So you think about the mass number of angels. The word hosts is one that's used to describe that. The earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is, that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Thus, we need to remember that human beings who have died, even the best and most faithful of Christians, they do not become angels after death. They are still souls. You turn to Revelation, you see over and over again the difference between angels who are worshiping and departed souls, faithful souls who died. They're two separate beings. Notice also that as created beings, they are subject to God. They're sent out by God to carry out purposes. They also can choose to reject or rebel against God. 
2 Peter 2 and verse 4, Jude and verse 6. The grim uh, takeaway and truth about that is that angels are unable, incapable of repenting. That when they choose to rebel against God, they are not offered forgiveness in the same way the human beings are. And also under this idea about them being not being human, not being deity, being created beings, in terms of sheer power, they are more powerful than human beings. But even the most powerful of angels is not as powerful as God. And so they have great power. You see that throughout the pages of Scripture where they will kill multitudes of people, where they will do some things that are very powerful, that are miraculous even, and yet none of their power is approaching that power of God. Thinking about number four on the screen, the idea that angels are sent by God to serve man, to serve those, Hebrews says, who are to inherit salvation. Think about Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9, the text that Cole referenced on Sunday night in talking about how we don't worship angels. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, you must not do that. Listen, I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers the prophets and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. They have a different mission. They have different roles. They have a different nature. But they have been created by God to serve the mission of God to help reach souls with the gospel of Christ. One of the ways in which you see them do that throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, both, is that they will appear in human form sometimes. They will uh, sometimes speak, uh, take on different forms, but they will communicate a specific message from God. So we're familiar with Luke chapter 1, 26, 27, when an angel specifically named Gabriel appears to Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. There was a specific angel sent to carry a specific message to Mary. The other end of Jesus' time on earth, John chapter 20, verse 11, the empty tomb, Mary stands outside weeping, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. The other gospel accounts make it clear. The angels, one of the angels is the first to tell them, he is not here, he is risen. Just think about the power of that, that, that God sends these spirits to communicate the message to Mary, to Joseph. You will bear the Son, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Sends two angels to be the first to tell human beings, Jesus is not here, he is risen. Do not fear, go and tell the disciples that Jesus is risen. But sometimes they also function in a miraculous way to protect God's people. That's what we see in Acts chapter 12. It's what we saw back in Daniel chapter 6. When Daniel is brought out of the lion's den by the king, king's ecstatic, Daniel's response, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. And so we need to be thankful for these truths, and thankful these are made clear in the pages of Scripture. Angels are not human beings, they're not flesh and blood. Neither are they deity. They're not God. They're not many gods. They're not half gods. They are created beings, rather. Created for a purpose of God to make known his will of salvation. But now let's look over one chapter to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 16. Talking about Jesus being in the flesh, coming in the flesh, suffering in the flesh, so that we as his brethren could, could know that he sympathizes with us. You ever caught this? Chapter 2, verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Catch that? Jesus didn't come into the flesh to save angels. He came into the flesh to save flesh. He came into the flesh, human being form, to save human beings, to help, to serve, to give us a path over sin through the gospel. 
And so God sent Jesus, the Son of God. He came himself in flesh and blood. He didn't send an angel. And the other side of that is Jesus, when he did come, he didn't come to save angels. He came to save mankind. Just think about this first idea on the screen, number five. Did God have the ability, the power to create angels, to send angels in such a way that could destroy enough human beings to in, incite fear within us to obey him lest we be killed? Some discussion in this text about whether or not it would be God the Son. But in 2 Kings 19, verse 35, you've got this stalemate between Hezekiah. He's shored up all the, 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 the inhabitants of Judea, Judah, Judeans in the city. Sennacherib, the Assyrian kings, already destroyed Israel. They're marching toward Judah. Uh, Hezekiah has them all walled up and protected and got the water supply flowing through the tunnels. But they're scared. They're trusting in God, but they're scared they're next. 2 Kings 19, verse 35, That night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. One angel, the angel of the Lord, destroyed 185,000. Imagine a natural disaster that would cause 185,000 deaths. The news that would make, the tragedy that would be worldwide. Could God have sent one angel, a legion of angels, the host of angels, to destroy enough of us to get us to listen up and to say, ooh, we better do what he says. See, he could have leveraged the power and the might of an angel if he wanted to, but he leveraged love instead. And so he came in the form of Jesus, flesh and blood, to suffer with us, to suffer for us, to die for us, not to kill us. So God didn't send an angel to save mankind. He sent Jesus. But we need to be thankful, too, for the uh, reality that Jesus, when he came to save, didn't just come to save, he didn't come to save angels, he came to save human beings. And this is such a special idea because angels themselves are interested in what we're experiencing. Angels clearly have some knowledge. There are passages that talk about what they know. But it's clear they don't know everything. Remember Jesus when he talks about when he will return? He says that he doesn't know when he will return. The Father knows. He also mentions the angels in heaven do not know. Wouldn't you think they should know? They're going to accompany him, right? You get to 2 Thessalonians 1, you know they're coming in flaming vengeance. And yet Jesus says there's a limit to their knowledge. So obviously some of the things of salvation were beyond their knowledge too. Because 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, speaking of the prophets in that early part of the verse, in the things that now have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. They are inspired and encouraged and curious by the love of God who would come in the form of man to save rebellious and sinful man. Jesus didn't come to save them. He came to save us. And that intrigues them. That brings uh, this, this good news to their eyes. They long to know what we now know through Christ. But finally, let's look at Hebrews 13 and verse 2. Text we read this morning. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. A little bit of a background there. Especially the first century, you had Christians dispersed. Especially by the time persecution begins to amp up, you've got more and more spreading out of Christians. It should be expected that if you have a brother or sister in Christ, even if you've never met them, yes, come stay with me while you're on the road. Come stay with me while you're hiding out. It's just that natural drawing in of hospitality. And you look at hospitality throughout the Old and New Testaments both. You also see that hospitality, more often than not, is really toward those who it's hardest to serve. You know, they have, would have had bigger homes that housed more family than our typical situation in 21st century America. And so most of the people that it would have been easiest to house and e easiest to serve probably were all in the same house. But they say you need to be on the lookout for opportunities to be hospitable. Well, what's part of the reasoning behind that? Hebrews 13 verse 2. For thereby... Some have entertained angels 
unawares. So this is a reminder, number seven, that angels do. In the history of the scripture, they've appeared in human likeness. You go all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 19, they appeared to Abraham as though they were men. They appeared before Gideon in Judges 13 as though they were men. A lot, and I guess that's back in Genesis 19, right? You've got Sodom and Gomorrah inhabitants that thought they were men. So I suppose this is where a lot of our fascination is attached. Well, if they can look like us or do look like us, does that mean they're living amongst us? I think we need to be careful in thinking that to be sure we're leaning on the last part of the verse just the same. Some have entertained angels unawares. Now, we now are living in a, a final dispensation of time where God doesn't use the miraculous to communicate his will to us, nor does he use the miraculous to prove that he is God or to prove we are to do something. And anything that would fall under the realm of providence, we are unaware of. Whether it's God who does it, whether he sends a spirit to do it, we don't know. As soon as we know it, it stops being unawares. Right? And so the problem becomes, not only do we sometimes, just culturally, when I say we, I mean we collectively, culturally, do we sometimes think, maybe that's an angel, or I, I'm certain that was an angel. We begin to place our faith in that experience instead of what God has revealed in his word. And it's not long before we think, well, that angel told me I didn't have to do this to please God. Or this angel told me to go do this to live out my faith. And God never said to do that. And so I think it's interesting. Even in a time of miraculous interaction with angels and humans and the miraculous with the spiritual gifts, in that time, in that era, Paul said, here's the gospel I've already preached to you, Galatians chapter 1. Even if an angel from heaven, he specifies where the angel's from, if an angel from heaven appears and teaches you something different, that gospel is accursed. You've already heard the truth. So if what we think is an angel, if what we think is some supernatural revelation appears to us, A, that goes against what God has said, he, he operates. But that can never go against Scripture, else it is clearly against His will. So we need to be aware of that, not to be uh, old-fashioned or not to be restrictive, uh, but to honor God's Word above all. Not above our feelings, not above our desires, but, above what he, but to elevate what He says above all. If he were to send an angel, we would not know that it's the case. And that's important. And that's necessary for us to build our faith on the truth of the gospel, the revealed will of Jesus Christ, instead of on an experience, instead of on a, a bailing out. Peter's instance was a singular incident. It's not once and for all, here's how God uses angels to rescue people. He might still use them to serve in some capacity. But if he does, we will not know it because he wants us to anchor our faith in his son, Jesus Christ. In my estimation, the, the passage of Hebrews 13, verse 2, is similar in, in thrust to Matthew 25. Remember that parable, the goat and the sheep? He says, when you did do these things you, to the least of these, you did them for me. When you didn't do them to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. Well, he's saying you are making spiritual decisions when you interact with each other. And when you are hospitable, you're making a spiritual decision just the same as you are a physical one. And you may entertain spiritual messengers. You may entertain and interact with some of God's greater purposes. You will not know what it is or how they work out this side of eternity. But there's always more to what's happening than what we can see. It should never be our aim to let our pride take over and try to see what he's told us we cannot see. So angels are, are, are great beings of God, created by God, created for a purpose, sent by a purpose. And as far as they might still be serving today, we will not know what they're doing. It will not be miraculous. It should be a constant reminder that there is more to how God has structured and ordered the world than what we see and what we know. But we are accountable for what we know from his word. His word gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the message of Jesus Christ, not an experience with an angel. 
We need to be reminded of Hebrew, or excuse me, of Ephesians chapter six, uh, verse twelve. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are spiritual battles, a spiritual battle beyond this realm of flesh and blood. We're called to stand firm and stand strong in our place in the world, not to sort out everything in the spiritual realm. And so we should take comfort in what God does reveal and leave the rest of what he does not reveal up to him and up to our curiosities that will be revealed in eternity. Our faith, our hope cannot rest in the thought of angels or what they might be doing. Our faith and hope must rest in the one who created them and has used them to serve us and reveal himself through them. While they are not worthy of our faith and worship, they are worth thanking God for because of how God has sent them to serve our needs. And as we close, just think about the gravity of this. These are powerful spiritual beings, powerful spirits. They have the ability to choose right or wrong, to do what God has commanded them to do or to reject it. But when they reject it, they do not have a way back to him. Jesus did not die for them, but he did die for you and for me. He did die to provide us a path back to him for forgiveness. Not only that, when we sin after becoming a Christian, we still have that path back to him through his blood as well. And so while we are thankful for how God has used angels in the past and how uh, amazing of a, a spiritual being they might be and how great and inciting this study may be, we need to leave this study with an immense appreciation for all God has done to ensure we have the opportunity to obey him and to please him by coming to him through his son, by obeying the gospel, be buried in the waters of baptism, to become a Christian, and to come back to him if we have wandered away. What a blessing that is. That we should remember all he's done and continues to do for us to help us know him through Jesus Christ. Tonight, if you need to respond to that invitation, please know that there's no better time to do it than right now. Uh, don't leave knowing that your soul is in jeopardy as you walk out those doors. Please let us help you any way that we can. Please know that we love you and are here for you and that the Lord loves you too. Would you come as we sing together?